So, Father God, in the name of Jesus, I ask that each and every person within the sound of my voice has good soil, that they will listen very carefully and try to understand and receive your word deep into their hearts so that they can produce a hundredfold. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And speak through me, Father God. I need you. I'm your vessel, Holy Spirit. You know, you're my mentor. You're my teacher. And we're partnering together, but I am submitted to you, Holy Spirit. So speak through me, please. In Jesus' name I pray. So today it's the law versus God's promises. I will start reading in Galatians 3.15 in the Passion Translation. Beloved friends, let me use an illustration that we can all understand. Technically, when a contract is signed, it can't be changed. After his, it has been put into effect, it's too late to alter its agreement. Now, we can all understand that and agree with that. If you're getting a divorce and you have signed the divorce agreement, that's it. It can't be changed. And that's with any contract. Once it's signed, it can't be changed once it's been put into effect. Going on to verse 16. Remember the royal proclamation God spoke over Abraham and to, the, to Abraham's child. God said that his promises were made to pass on to Abraham's child, not children. And who is this child? It's the son of promise, Jesus, the anointed Messiah. This means that the covenant between God and Abraham was fulfilled in Messiah and cannot be altered. Yet the written law was not even given to Moses until 430 years later after God had signed his contract with Abraham. The law then doesn't supersede the promise since the royal proclamation was given before the law. If that were the case, it would have been nullified what God said to Abraham. We receive all the promises because of the promised one, not because we keep the law. Why then was the law given? It was meant to be an intermediary agreement, meaning in between. In between the giving of the promise and the fulfillment of the promise. Added after God gave the promise of the coming one. It was given to show men how guilty they are and remained in force until a seed was born to fulfill the promises given to Abraham. When God gave the law, he didn't give it to them directly. For he gave it first to the angels. They gave it to Moses, his mediator or lawyer, who then gave it to the people. Now, a mediator does not represent just one party, but God fulfilled it, the promise, all by himself. Same thing when you're in mediation. Uh, like I, I go back to divorce proceedings, but you'll have two parties and you'll have a mediator. This mediation happened indirectly, like God gave it to angels, angels gave it to Moses, Moses gave it to the people. But when God made the promise and the covenant and the contract with Abraham, he gave it by himself directly to Abraham, meaning he was responsible for fulfilling what he promised. Like if I make a promise to you, I say, you know, I promise you I will make you a flan. You have to do nothing but receive it. Now it's all on me to fulfill the promise I made to you. Verse 21, since that's true, should we consider the written law to be contrary to the promise of new life? How absurd. Truly, if there was a law that we could keep which would give us new life, then our salvation would have come by law keeping. But the scriptures make it clear that since we are all under the power of sin, we needed Jesus, and he is the Savior who brings the promise to those who believe. And we learned last week and continue to learn by grace, by believing, by faith. It's all by faith. So the concept of the promise is that we all need faith to believe it. This is the revelation that grace, grace is what saves us for the promise is enough. And let's remind ourselves, what's grace? It's the free and unmerited favor and love of God. 
and this it springs forth it comes from the source it's the source of all the benefits that we receive from him is all through grace so the law was intended to reveal our sin not to secure righteousness it was a temporary measure introduced to convince people of their need for justification and of their inability to save themselves thus leading us to Christ. So the law was always pointing us to Christ because it was saying, this is the demands and you can't fulfill it. The law was inferior to the promise having come through angels and Moses in contrast to the promise that came directly from God with him alone having responsibility to fulfill it. The law is not contrary to the promise, rather it's complementary. I like that. Remember it came intermediary intermediarily, <laughs> meaning in between. So it's complementary. The law demanded righteousness, but it was powerless to provide it. Its function was to prepare the gospel, prepare for the gospel by making people conscious of their sin and their need of a savior. Nobody was ever able. I mean, come on. Can you keep all Ten Commandments perfectly every single day of your life? No. Thank God for the grace of God. So the law and the promise, which is grace, each have a distinct function. The law brings conviction of sin, which unravels grace as the way to salvation. The law moves us. It even compels us to reach for grace. And this I love so much. Grace will cause one to soar even higher than the demands of the law. His grace, our thankfulness, for his grace, that we believe we have been made the children of God by his grace through faith, the, the just shall live by faith, that will cause us to soar even higher than the demands of the law because we love him and we have a love relationship with him. Like I've heard people even, um, you know, when they, when they start complaining about the tithe, and they're like, yo, you don't want to give 10%, give more, you know, soar higher. <laughs> not many people want to do that but <laughs> we I, that's what I love grace will cause us to soar even higher than the demands of the law why because I want to please my father I love him I need him I can't live without him he's my everything and so I may mess up every single day of my life but I thank God for the grace of God that I can come to him and say Lord father I messed up Please forgive me. Please help me to, to change my heart. Do something. Do surgery on me. Help me to be better for you. Not because being better will get me entrance into heaven, but being better will cause me to please you because I love you. Because I'm already washed in the blood of Jesus. I'm already righteous in his sight. When he looks down through me, he sees me through the blood. Jesus is standing in front of me. When the Father looks at me, he has to look through Jesus to see me. So positionally, he already sees us as righteous. But walking it out and fleshing it out in this world, that requires our cooperation with the Holy Spirit to walk it out in submission, in repentance continually before the God that we love, that is our dad, Jesus, who is our Lord and Savior, and the Holy Spirit, who is absolutely everything to us because he is all that we need to live this life in godliness, in Jesus' name. So moving on to Galatians 3.23, and now I'm shifting into the New Living Translation. Before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were placed under guard by the law. We were kept in protective custody. I love these words, <laughs> so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. Let me put it another way. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. And now that the way of faith has come, we no longer need the law as our guardian guardian for you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus and all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes there is no longer Jew nor Gentile slave or free 
male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. I love those words, protective custody. Now, the Greek word pedagogos, okay, which that's where we get the word pedagogue, which means schoolmaster or guardian. The law was our schoolmaster. It was our guardian. In New Testament times, the person who was put in charge as the guardian was a personal servant who accompanied the master's child wherever the child went, including to school, acting as guardian and exercising a degree of discipline over the child. In a similar way, the purpose of God's law for a time was to guide people in God's ways, guard their behavior, and provide discipline. But the highest purpose of God's law is to reveal sin, to expose our inability to live up to God's perfect standard, which then points us to our need for Christ and his saving work. So the law was our guardian, and it kept the people of Israel safe in the protective custody because now they had these boundaries of the law where the Gentiles did not have. And yes, it showed them more than anything that they could not keep the law. And that's why he had that also temporary system of sacrifice of animals so that they can come to the Lord and transfer their sins onto the animal and be made right. It would cover, not annihilate. What I love about Jesus is he's the grand eraser. Those, those animals covered the sin, but when Jesus came, he erased it. Hallelujah. He's the magic eraser, but not really a magic eraser. I would say the anointed eraser. We don't believe in magic. <laughs> so, you know, I love that. Um, so then when Jesus came, and now we were brought from the law into grace. We didn't need the guardian. And now the law does not become null and void. Because remember, Jesus fulfilled the law. But the law, then it could rest because now everything's in grace. Everything has to be out of our, our love and appreciation, knowing that we were dead before Christ. And now we are alive forevermore. We are born again. We belong to the heavenly realm. We are seated with Christ in the heavenly realm. Hallelujah. Okay, let's see. Okay, the law directed us to Christ. It restricted us as a jailer and as a guardian until faith in Christ brought us into the freedom of full-grown son and daughters who have received their rightful heritage. Hallelujah. Now, in verse 27, it says, And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. Now, they're not talking about water baptism here. They're talking about when you give your heart to Jesus, you are receiving the Holy Spirit. You not, might not be receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit by speaking in tongues, but you are still receiving the Holy Spirit into you. It's like you are being baptized into Christ. You are now sealed, and you belong to him. It says, the exalted position of sons and daughters of God involves a living union. When we give our life to God, when we surrender our life to Jesus, we are then brought into a living union where the Holy Spirit is brought into us, and that's what the baptism into Christ is talking about here. It joins all believers to Christ and unites them within the church. I love also putting on Christ, putting on Christ like new clothes, getting rid of those old rags and putting on these royal robes of righteousness which is brought by his blood hallelujah and as you know there's nobody spiritually superior over the other that we are all one in Christ Jesus when we're talking about either Jew or Gentile slave or free male and female it's not saying that there's no male and female just saying that we are all equal Nobody superior in Christ. Hallelujah. You know, like the, the slave and the master, not that, you know, not that we do that here, but in God's eyes, they're equal. The master is not above the slave in Christ Jesus. In hmm. verse 29. 
Okay, and now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs. And God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. What does it mean by true children? Well, because there were many of Israel that were natural children of, of Abraham. But if they do not receive Jesus as their Lord, as their Messiah, then it doesn't even matter if they're in the natural genealogy to be, uh, to be children of Abraham. You are only a true child of Abraham if you give your life to Messiah, which many Jews as well as Gentiles have. And so anybody who gives their life to Jesus, surrender your life to Jesus, then you are ch true children of Abraham in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Because it's all about surrender. It's all about surrender. You know, I mean, we do this, we do this sinner's prayer, and it, it could be. It could, come in many different forms. We call it the sinner's prayer, but it really is all about coming to a point in your life where you're just saying, you know what? I'm done. I give you my life. Take, what, take my life, Jesus, and do what you will with it. I surrender to you. I'm yours now. That's what it really is. We're his now. Moving on to chapter four. You guys are getting the word. You guys are getting meat here. So... If you're used to milk, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. <laughs> Galatians 4, 1 through 7, he's going to further explain. Paul is amazing. Think of it this way. If a father dies and leaves an inheritance for his young children, those children are not much better off than slaves until they grow up, even though they actually own everything their father had. It's like having a trust. Until they become of age, they can't touch it. They have to obey their guardians until they reach whatever age their father set. Verse 3, and that's the way it was with us before Christ came. We were like children. We were slaves to the basic spiritual principles of this world. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom, to redeem us who were slaves to the law so that he can uh, adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent his, the spirit of his son into our hearts prompl promptly, prompting, goodness gracious, us to call out, Abba, Father, Dad, now, you are no longer a slave. You are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, you ha God has made you his heir. There's a lot here. Mm -hmm. So as we know, the first part of it is talking about how, you know, we were like mi minor-aged children that um, did not have access to the inheritance until Christ came. So that's, I think you can, you get that kind of right? Because this is all comparison, illustration by Paul, who's amazing. Hey, Paul. Um, and the way that it was before Christ, then we were like children, we were like slaves. I know people don't like the word slaves, but you know, look, back then there were slaves, and this is the way it was explained. But we were slaves. We were slaves to sin before we gave our life to Jesus. We were slaves to sin. So it says here we were slaves to the basic spiritual principles of this world. Under the law, we were like an heir during his minority years, subject to guardians until he became of age. Okay, slaves to this world system. We were slaves to the world system and the evil spirits that used the rituals of the law to enslave and condemn. I mean, basically... Whether you are, before you gave your life to Christ, whether you were actively involved in things you shouldn't have been, like witchcraft or new age, or not, you were still slaves. You still belonged to the kingdom of darkness. But when Jesus came and you gave your life to Jesus, you are no longer slaves to the spiritual principles of this world or their demons. You might still need deliverance. That's a whole other story. But, you know, you can seek deliverance because Christians need deliverance. Deliverance isn't just for the unsaved. 
We come with a soul tainted that has been given over to the enemy. And even as Christians, we can still do that and open doors to the enemy that he might not possess, but he can oppress and so. Don't think that because you're in Christ, you don't need deliverance. We may all need deliverance at one way or another, or you might have come to the point in your life where you have submitted your life to Jesus, that in your private time with him, he has brought deliverance. Because deliverance doesn't always have to be done by a deliverance minister. If you're really serious with God, I mean, I'm serious. I'm talking like you get down dirty serious with the Lord Jesus Christ, he will bring deliverance. It might come in, 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 in parts, but he can bring you to full deliverance in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Okay, verse 4 talks about Jesus being born of a woman and subject to the law. Every child has a mother, but for Jesus to be born of a woman meant that there was no human father, no male counterpart. So that's what that means. We all got mama and daddy. Jesus had mama and that daddy. No human father. And it says, but he was subject to the law. Christ was born under the law as a Jew. He kept the law perfectly, and he fulfilled it, and finally paid its curse. He was made sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 in the New King James says, For he, the, the Father, made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He, he was made sin for us. It's like he, the great exchange. He took our sin. He became sin so that he, can get, he gave us his righteousness. It's this wonderful div divine trade that I am very thankful for as long as we are in him. Everything is all about in him. You could actually do a study about everywhere in the Bible, especially it's the New Testament mostly, that says in him, in whom, in Christ. And you will find... A really nice rabbit trail that, you know, help you learn who you are in him, what's expected of you in him, in whom, in Christ. I challenge you. Verse 5 through 7, let's see. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for redeeming us and buying us back so that he could adopt us. It's all about that. Do you know that it was all about that? Jesus wanted to buy you back from slavery. He wanted to buy you out of slavery to sin, all because all he wanted to do was adopt you to be ch ch children of the Lord God. I don't know why I'm getting a little, 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 but that's what he wanted. That's all Jesus cared about was reconciling you to the Father. That's all he cared about you. That's why... The curtain was torn from top to bottom, access. Before it was access denied with only one priest having to do it for you. Now we have open access to the Father by the broken body of Jesus Christ. And I love the fact that because now we are his kids, he sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. And this Holy Spirit within us calls us prompts us to say, Father, you're my dad. He's my dad. And like you all know, I really never had a dad. So to have a dad, to have that, that freedom to know that he's my father and he loves me and he cares for me and he looks out for me and he strengthens me, that is what we should all allow the Holy Spirit within us to do is to prompt us to call him our father, our papa, is a I can't use the word daddy anymore because the new generation has soiled the word daddy, but we can call him Papa. Hallelujah. You are no, I love that, because we sang no longer slaves, I think, last week or something. You are no longer a slave. You are God's own child, and you are heir with Jesus. That's all God wanted was a family. That's all he wanted, but he wanted a family, not of robots, he wanted, he wanted your free will to say yes to him. He's such a wonderful father. On to Galatians 4, 8 through 11. Hallelujah. How am I doing? How are you doing? You guys doing all right? Okay. 
Before you Gentiles knew God, you were slaves to so-called gods that do not even exist. That means demons. Because the false gods that they were worshiping were actually demons. So now that you know God, or should I say now that God knows you, why do you want to go back again and become slaves once more to the weak and useless spiritual principles of this world? You are trying to earn favor with God by observing certain days or months or seasons or years. I fear for you. Perhaps all my hard work with you was for nothing. Goodness gracious. Paul poured in everything. He poured all of himself. He had such a revelation of the Christ, and he did not want anybody to be lost. So verses 8 and 9 were similar to verses 3, that we were slaves to demons and to the world system that's demonic. But now that you know God, why do you want to go back again and become slaves? Goodness gracious, that's like a dog going back to his poop. Or, I know I've seen, or you know, the prison's, prison's door has been opened and you've been set free, but you go back into the prison and you close the door. Why would you want to do that? That's what he's saying to the Galatians. What's wrong with you? You're, you've got freedom in Christ and you want to go back into the prison under the guardian. You're trying to earn that's our problem as, as humans. We always want to earn our way. But with God, there's no earning our way. Under the influence of the Judaizers, the Galatians had begun to observe the Mosaic calendar. They kept special days and season festivals, seasonal festivals such as Passover, Pentecost, and tabernacles. They did this thinking that they would thereby gain additional merit with God. There is nothing wrong if one wants to observe these special days. Paul objected to the Gentiles taking them as a means of salvation or getting brownie points with the Father. Don't work like that. So now we're going to read how Paul is challenging the Galatians and reminding them. Let's see. Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to live as I do in freedom from these things. For I have become like you Gentiles, free from those laws. You did not mistreat me when I first preached to you. Surely you remember that I was sick when I first brought you the good news. But even though my condition tempted you to reject me, you did not despise me or turn me away. No. You took me in and cared for me as though I were an angel from God or even Christ Jesus himself. Where is that joyful and grateful spirit you felt then? I'm sure you would have taken out your own eyes and given them to me if it had been possible. Have I now become your enemy because I'm telling you the truth? So he's telling them, look, he's challenging them. Live as I do in freedom from these things. I became like you. I became free of all this. But now you want to become like a Judaizer and, and get under the law? Be free like I'm free because I'm free because I'm imitating you, you and your freedom. Do you, you, know, you get that? Huh? Be free as I'm free. Don't go back to the law. And then he says, you didn't miss. Now, he's trying to remind them of the love they had in the past. He said, you did not mistreat me. And when I first preached you, and he talked about how he was sick, and it was probably repulsive. The fact that he even mentioned that they would take out their own eyes and, and give them his eye, their eyes was probably because he had, maybe it could have been, I don't know, uh, some sort of eye issue that was kind of repulsive maybe, you know, who knows? Maybe it altered the way he looked. Maybe it was really oozing and gross. I don't know. But whatever it was, they didn't care. They loved on him. They cared for him. They treated him with respect. And he's trying to remind them, like, do you remember that? But now, all of a sudden, because I'm telling you the truth, I'm becoming your enemy? How often does that happen? Where we have people in our lives, and they're 
in deception and we love them and we try to now gently and lovingly give them the truth and now they turn away from us. Don't shoot the messenger. But that's what human nature does. And that's what it seems like here because they're trying to cling to something that's wrong. And because it's messing with what they want and the direction they want to go, now they're treating Paul as the enemy. Galatians 4, 17 through 20. Those false teachers are so eager to win your favor, but their intentions are not good. They are trying to shut you off from me. Doesn't, isn't that what abusers do? Abusers try to shut you off from your family. They try to separate you from your loved ones so that they can now manipulate you. That's what they're trying to do here. They are trying to shut you off from me so that you will pay attention only to them. If someone is eager to do good things for you, that's all right. But let them do it all the time, not just when I'm with you. Oh, my dear children, I feel as if I'm going through labor pains for you again. And they will continue until Christ is fully developed in your lives. I wish I were with you right now so I could change my tone. But at this distance, I don't know how else to help you. So as you know, he was trying to point out that these Judaizers did not have good intention. They wanted control. Paul was a father. He said that there was not many fathers, but he was truly a father. He was a parent. That's why he's saying, I'm, I'm suffering labor pains for you again, and these pains are not going to go away until I know that Christ has developed back into you. It, it, it grieved him as it grieves the Holy Spirit. He was probably so in tune with the Holy Spirit that just seeing them walk in the wrong path, walking away from grace and faith into the law, it grieved him and he travailed and he wants to now see them back fully developed in Christ again. Such a good father and we need more fathers in the kingdom of God. And I asked the Lord to help me to be a good mother. And even if I have to speak the inconvenient truth to you, that I will. All right, so now we're going to move on to an allegory of Abraham. We are finishing up. I'm very proud of you. Galatians 4, 21 through 31. Tell me, you who want to live under the law, do you know what the law actually says? I love him. <laughs> The scriptures say that Abraham had two sons. Oh, this is so good. One from his slave wife and one from his freeborn wife. The son of the slave wife was born in a human attempt to bring about the fulfillment of God's promise. But the son of the freeborn wife was born as God's own fulfillment of his promise. These two women serve as an illustration of God's two covenants. The first woman, Hagar, represents Mount Sinai, where the people received the law that enslaved them. And now Jerusalem is just like Mount Sinai in Arabia because she and her children live in slavery to the law at that current time. But the other woman, Sarah, represents the heavenly Jerusalem. She is the free woman, and she is our mother. As Isaiah said, Rejoice, O childless woman, you who have never given birth. Break joy, break into a joyful shout, you who had never been in labor. For the desolate woman now has more children than the woman who lives with her husband. And it's true. Sarah has many children of faith. And now verse 28 says, And you, dear brothers and sisters, are children of the promise, just like Isaac. But you are now being persecuted by those who want to keep the law, just as Ishmael, the child born by human effort, persecuted Isaac, the child born by the power of the Spirit. But what do the scriptures say about that? Get rid of the slave and her son. Now, I know that sounds really harsh, but it really is in turn saying, get rid of your legalism. For the son of the slave woman will not share the inheritance with the free woman's son. The law will not share the inheritance of grace. So dear brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave women, woman. We are children of the free woman. So let's break it down. 
Abraham knew he had a promise from the Lord, but he thought he'd help him. Sarah was in on it. Go get Hagar pregnant. We'll have our son through Hagar. Not a good idea. All that did was bring jealousy and persecution because Hagar then started getting puffed up and we're like, ha-ha, I got a son. What do you have? And then even when she had Isaac, Ishmael persecuted Isaac, which is what the law, the Judaizers, were persecuting the ones trying to live by grace, by faith. That's what it's saying, and it's true. We are living in persecution in this world as child, children of God, but that's okay because we are children born by the power of the Spirit, just like Isaac. So the old covenant of the law, um, symbolized by Hagar, the slave girl. Ishmael, a son born after the flesh, human effort, represents Jerusalem in Paul's day that was still in spiritual and political bondage. The new covenant of grace is symbolized by Sarah, the free woman. Isaac, a son born miraculously by God's promise, represents the heavenly Jerusalem, which is free and glorious. The manner in which the sons were conceived, Ishmael was born in the ordinary way, that is, in the course of nature, the flesh, and requiring no miracle and no promise of God. In fact, he was the result of Abraham trying to help God. And that's what we're trying to do when we're trying to keep the law to get, to get our brownie points with the Father. We're trying to help God. We're trying to say, look, God, look at, look at what I'm doing. He represents the work of the flesh. Isaac, on the other hand, was born as a result of, the pro of a promise or prophecy, thus by faith. Abraham and Sarah um, were, born, were beyond the age of childbearing. Right? I think Sarah was 90 and he was 100. I was like, oh, my gosh. But God miraculously fulfilled his promise in bringing life out of the deadness of Sarah's womb. So in turn, in this example with Sarah and Hagar, the first becomes the last and the last becomes the first. The barren wife Sarah becomes fruitful and the bondwoman Hagar is set aside because grace supersedes the law. Hallelujah. So we learned today that God's promise, his covenant came first, and it is all by faith, and it supersedes the law. The law revealed our sin and our inability to keep it, thus pointing us to the gospel, hallelujah for the gospel, and that we are the true children of Abraham, children of faith, because we belong to Christ, who is the fulfillment of the promise, hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Glory to God. Oh, Father God, thank you for your word. I, I pray that it was mm, deposited deep within each person and that we will go forth knowing whose we are, that we belong to you, and that we under grace, and that grace supersedes the law, and that the law still is in effect, of course, the moral law, and that we will always aim to please you by learning of you, reading your word, for the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and the word is Jesus Christ. And as we read your word, we are reading and partaking of Jesus the Messiah and learning of him because we are true disciples of Jesus Christ, and we are learning from the master, and we are doing what the master ex expects of us. Why? Because he bled and died for us. And out of our love for the master, we look to please him with our lives. I declare that over us in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah.